So I guess it's about, uh, about time to start. Right, so this, um, I'm giving this talk because last time we had a Zen Summit, I had a special talk just for people who are regularly part of the people, part of the community, um, who are not maintainers, who wanted to help review patches. And none of the people I had in mind showed up, but instead a bunch of people came who had never contributed to Zen and wanted to know how the process worked. So I decided this time to, to give a talk about that. So, um, so who here uh, has ever uh, submitted a patch to any open source project at all? So, okay, a couple people. Um, and who here has submitted a patch to um, on the Zen developed mailing list to Zen. Okay, one person, right? Um, right. So I guess uh, this is meant to be kind of a discussion section. So uh, please, I've got a whole bunch of slides that we can talk about. But uh, if you want to pause on anything or dwell on anything, if you want to have a, any questions about anything, then just um, wait, put up your hand and and we'll we'll, we'll give it a stop. Okay. Sound good? Okay, so the first thing to say is we actually do want your patches. Um, and I think it's always helpful when you're having a conversation to, to know people's motivations. So the first thing I'm going to just say, um, so why do we actually want your patches? Uh, so the first thing is, as maintainers, people who, who run the thing, we, we, work, we spend a lot of time working on Zen. And it's personally gratifying to be able to know that Zen is useful to a wide number of people. Um, but of course, our, all of us who are maintainers, uh, work, the core work on Zen, we, um, we're paid by companies. And they don't pay us you know, for our own personal benefit, they pay us for their own benefit. Um, so why do our companies care about your patches getting in? Well, to begin with, um, so our companies care about the mind share of Zen and the Zen brand. So uh, Citrix, Oracle, Zusa, all the different people who contribute to Zen, they benefit indirectly um, from every person who uses Zen, even if they're not buying one of our products, still benefits us indirectly. Um, finally, of course, they may actually want to, oops, sorry, Let's go back a second. You may someday want to use the code that you're submitting, okay? So the feature that you're working on that you care about may not be a priority for them, but they may actually want to use it. And in the case of, um, something like Zen and ARM, it may be that uh, in the future that they're, 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 they're going to use it. So that said, uh, there's a tension here because we do want your patches. Um, on the other hand, you, so people talk about free software. They say things like, you know, free beer, uh, free as in beer versus free as in uh, free speech. Um, but for maintainers, free software is often um, free as in puppies, right? So if you ever had an animal, uh, owned an animal, you know that even if the puppy is free to acquire, it is certainly not free to keep. Um, and so this is how often maintainers feel about accepting patches from people. Uh, because people come by, they submit a patch, and us as maintainers know that we are the ones who are probably going to have to deal with bugs, who are going to have to support um, people. And so actually accepting patches into our product is, is, is more work for us at some level. Um, so there's a bit of a tension. So if, if you hear people, us as maintainers, pushing back a little bit on your, uh, on your patches or, or being a bit picky about how they are, um, just keep this in mind that we, we do appreciate your patch and we, we do want it in, but um, it's actually, it's not free for us. Right, so with that in mind, um, how does any patch get in? Right, so we have uh, a concept of maintainers. So there is, the Zen code base is large enough, it's not nearly as big as Linux, but it's still large enough that there's no single person who can understand everything about it and be able to make a reasonable comment on it. So um, we divide up the, uh, the and, and that's a problem, because if there's not someone who actually understands the whole thing, you have this, what's called, what you might call the one little change problem. Okay, so someone who, someone who doesn't know anything about the code base comes and they look at this big massive thing and they're like, well, okay, I want to add my feature in or it, I have this bug that I want to fix. And so obviously what they want to do is they want to make the smallest change possible. So they say, well, I'll just change this little thing here or I'll add a special case over here. Um, and uh, if there's nobody who has a long-term investment in the quality of the code base, they sort of look at that and say, well, it does fix a bug. I, I, 
I guess just check it in. And the result is that you get like little bit by little bit, you accumulate all these little hacks and pretty soon the thing is just an unmaintainable mess. Um, so the idea behind a maintainer, their role is to have a long-term investment in keeping the code that they're responsible for clean. They're responsible to understand how it works. They're responsible to understand all the people who contribute to it. And um, they're responsible to, for, for the, the idea of someone comes in and says, I want to make this new feature. Here's a little, a little tiny change that'll make it work. Um, it's a job of the maintainer to say, well, actually, that is a good thing to have, but what we're going to have to do is re-architect the whole interface um, and design, decide how that re-architecture is going to happen. So um, the list of maintainers is in a file called maintainers. Uh, it's in a uh, human-readable and sort of machine-readable format. Um, you can also use a, uh, there's a script called git maintainer. Uh, so if you Git, say this is copied from Linux. If you run git maintainer on your patch, it will give you a list of the email addresses of all the people that you need to CC, um, f uh, all the people who maintain the, the different parts of the, the code that you patch. Um, there's also a concept of nested maintainership that we have. Uh, so I maintain the x86 MM subsystem, the memory management subsystem, um, but the memory management subsystem, subsystem is a part of the x86 system as a whole. And for that, there's two co-maintainers, Jan and, and Andy, who are sort of unnested under, underneath their maintainership. Uh, and we'll get to how those interact a little later. Um, and th there are some parts of the code that don't have an explicit maintainer. And for them, that's called basically the, the rest. So if you find in the, um, some bit of the, the code that uh, isn't isn't explicitly listed in the maintainers file, then there's another group of people called the rest, and they sort of collectively uh, look after that code. Okay, so when does a patch actually get checked in? So the, the requirements under normal conditions, requirements for, for a patch to be checked in are, you have to have approval of all the maintainers whose code the patch touches, right? So if your patch touches some of the MM system and the tooling system, then you need my ACK for, as the MM maintainer and you need the tool system maintainers act. Um, and it also, in general, needs the approval or at least the acquiescence of everyone who has raised an issue on the patch. So uh, you, as someone who's on the mailing list, can raise issues and, and, and question um, any post that any, um, any patch that anyone else uh, posts. Um, but anyone can also question your, your uh, patch as well. And so in general, uh, we try to aim for uh, lazy consensus. We try to aim for consensus. Um, and so in general, uh, the maintainer or the committers will, will wait until everyone who has ever raised an issue has said, said that they're satisfied. Okay. So there's another just minor thing to, to talk about, and that's the committers. So technically, um, not everyone has, uh, not all the maintainers have physical access to actually check things in. There's a much smaller group of people called committers who um, actually have the, the, uh, the permissions to be able to actually check something into the core tree. And um, now, strictly speaking, this is a sec secretarial role, right? So the role of a committer is to make sure that it has the proper acts and then check it in when, when, it, has the, the, when, it, when it has everything that it needs. Um, but of course, to have the actual access the, the, um, to the core Zen repository also implies a level of trust. So we have uh, the Zen project, we've kind of use this role. We don't have a, a benevolent dictator for life. We don't have a, a central person like Linus Torvalds or something like that. So we've, we've used the committer role as a sort of, you know, final authority slash elder council um, role. So, and of course that brings up what's called conflict resolution. There's a lot of potential conflicts here, right? Uh, so what if um, the committer, so what if the uh, a maintainer thinks something should be checked in, but some random person has said, I don't think that's a good idea. What happens if I, as a nested, um, someone nested under, so if I say I, this is a bad idea, but the x86 maintainers think it's a good idea, right? Well, what happens then? So to begin with, the first thing we try to do in the Zen project is try to cons achieve consensus, okay? We try to make sure that everyone kind of agrees on what's going on. But that's not always, always going to happen. So we have different levels of kind of overruling. So anyone who is a maintainer, can overrule someone who's not a maintainer, right? So if you post a path to the MM code, someone who's not a maintainer says, I don't like that idea, and I say, well, we're just gonna go with it. 
um, then I can overrule that. But this is kind of in yellow because that's not actually a very nice thing to do. I wouldn't do that unless I thought it was really important. Um, nested maintainers can overrule or stand in for lower level maintainers, right? So if I said this is a terrible idea, I don't think we should do this, and Yon or Andy, the, the x86 maintainers, the global x86 maintainers, said, um, actually, this is what we're going to do, they could overrule me. Um, but obviously, overruling me when I say that's a bad idea is e kind of even a worse thing. Um, they can also, this is why it's in white, they can stand in for me if, if I'm on holiday or I just don't respond in, in a month, then they can, they can, if they think it's important enough, they can just hack it and check it in themselves. Um, and of course, um, if there's a maintainer who's being completely un, um, unreasonable, then a majority of the vo vote of the committers can overrule a maintainer. Uh, but obviously this is in red because, I mean, if you're a maintainer of a code and, and someone says, you know, this is the way it should be, and you're overruled by that, I mean, that's, the likely effect that would happen after that is that the person would, you know, I think they would be probably offended and leave the project. So, um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a, a range of escalation pro possibilities here. But because there's an escalation possibility, usually none of these things actually happen, right? So if someone comes and says, I don't think this is a good idea, and the maintainer says, I think it's a good idea, that person's probably gonna say, well, I guess okay then. Because if you can see that eventually you're gonna be overruled, you might as well make it seem like you went along with it. <laughs> so, um, but this level of escalation is, is there for you if you think that you, your passion is to get in, and you think that um, someone's being unreasonable, you can, you can ask the maintainer to overrule, or if you think the maintainer's being unreasonable, you can go to the committers and ask them to overrule it. Um, okay, so the last thing to say is, as far as expectation is, expect iteration. So there's very few patches, longer than four lines of code, that ever get in without someone saying, can you change this, right? Even, say, the, the two x86 maintainers, Jan and Andy, or um, the two tool stack maintainers, Wei and um, Ian Jackson, even though they work together completely, very, very closely, if the patch is longer than four lines long, if it changes more than four lines, it's very unlikely that Andy will post a patch that Jan doesn't want one or two things changed on, or something like that. Um, so, uh, just expect to have, to go through it uh, several times. Um, development cycle, when can things be checked in? So, first of all, normal time we have what's called the development window. Uh, and during the development window, all you need to have is the maintainer's ACK and the acquiescence of everyone who's, who's uh, ever commented on it to be checked in. Um, and most of the time, we're in the, in the what's called the development window. There's another time, um, so there's a, something called the last posting date, where, which is two weeks before the feature freeze. And between the last posting date and the feature freeze, uh, it can be checked in um, with the same thing as normal, like with one additional, additional requirement, is that the first version of the, of the patch has to have been posted before the last posting date. Does that make sense? So if you post version one before the last posting date, then you can post version two, three, four, five between the last posting date and the feature freeze, okay? Um, but if you haven't posted version one by the last posting date, then you have to wait until the next iteration. And the reason for this is that uh, otherwise, if, if we say there's, there's, a, there's a hard feature freeze, bam, at this date, then everyone's going to pile their patches in like the day or two beforehand, um, and there's going to be sort of one or two days of not very nice stuff for the, all, the, all the people reviewing it. So say in two weeks, um, we have two weeks to kind of fix things up. Okay. Um, and we have a fixed development cycle. Um, so, so then we have a feature freeze where during about six weeks, um, there's two additional requirements. Uh, the first of all is it has to be a bug fix. There's no, no new features. Um, it has to have all the acts that are normal, but it also has to have the approval of someone called the release manager. So it's the release manager's job to be the bad guy, right? So everyone agrees that during the, 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 the feature freeze, um, in general, uh, feature, um, bug fixes and changes should be minimized. But everyone thinks that their own patch <laughs> is important enough to get in during the feature freeze, right? So the job of the release manager is to be the bad guy and, and to, to tell everybody, no, you can't have your patch um, in. Everyone agrees this should happen. No one should, thinks it should happen to them, so that's their job. Um, and then, of course, we have the uh, release. So we have a fixed release time. Um, the releases will happen in the beginning of June and the beginning of December. Um, and as I said, there's a six-week feature freeze, and there's a two-week sort of last posting date before them. So 
during the opening of any development cycle, so we just started the 410 development cycle, um, the release manager early on will post when the last posting date is, um, and when the feature freeze is going to be, um, and when the expected release date is going to be. And then you can have a, you can plan your development for when you get your um, features posted. Okay, any questions about that so far? Okay, so how do you actually write a good patch or a good patch series? Um, so the first thing to say is that there are a thousand unwritten rules um, that uh, even if we did write them down, um, you wouldn't enjoy reading it. So you would either stop reading halfway through or you would get, well, you, you, you don't know how to stop re reading halfway through anyway because it's going to be really boring, right? So the only way to learn all these unwritten rules is to be told them one at a time as you accidentally transgress them. Um, so don't worry if you post a patch and the first thing you're told is all these different things you did wrong, okay? That's expected, right? The only way for you to learn all those things is to post the patch and be told about it. So no one's upset um, ab about the fact that you didn't follow these rules. Um, so as you're writing your patch, think about the audience. And there's three different audiences you should be thinking about when you're writing a patch. The first is, obvious, is the reviewer, the person reviewing the code to decide whether, whether it's going to go in. Um, the second is people looking for patches of interest. Uh, so either they're scanning the, the, um, they're scanning the mailing list to decide which patches they want to look at and review. Um, they are scanning uh, for features they want to backport or they're scanning for bug fixes. Um, and so typically someone who, hello, okay. So typically someone would basically see it kind of a list like this, um, just one line. And so we want to have this one line summary be just enough to allow someone to know whether they need to look in more detail or not, okay? Um, so people looking at patches of interest. And the third person is what we call an archeologist, okay? So this is someone in a year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years time who is looking at the code and trying to say, they see some bit of the code and they're like, why is this code the way it is? Okay, and there's a concept that I found recently called Chesterton's fence. Has anyone heard of this thing before? Okay, well, so Chesterton was a, um, uh, he's about a, a hundred years ago actually, but he was kind of heavily involved in politics. And one of the things that he said um, is that if you find a rule, like a law in the country or something like that, you shouldn't, you should never try to change the law until you understand why it was there in the first place, right? Um, so he said, like, say there was a fence, right? If, 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 you bought some, if you bought some piece of land, and you walk out in it, and then there's a fence somewhere, before you take down the fence, you need to find out why the fence was there in the first place. Because maybe, um, you know, maybe it was, you can't see a reason for it right now. Maybe the reason it was put up was a bad reason, and it should be removed. Maybe when it was put up, there was a good reason for it, but now it's no longer a good reason, so we can take it down. Or maybe the reason it was put up still exists and we need to leave it there, right? So, um, uh, and I actually just had this happen. Um, there was a, a hyper call that someone wanted to change um, about a month ago and it wasn't clear what the purpose of the hyper call was and so I looked back when to, to see what the change log said when it was checked in. It was checked in in 2005, so it was more than 10 years ago um, and it helped me understand what the purpose of the hyper call was and sort of uh, have a better opinion about why it should or shouldn't be changed. So. Part of the person you're writing the patch for, um, the description of the, of the change log is someone 10 years from now, maybe, who is trying to figure out why this code is the way it is. Okay. Um, so, follow, another thing to do, a simple thing you can do is follow the coding style. Okay, these, there's um, two different files. Just, just for fun, we have two different coding styles. So, most of the hypervisor um, follows this coding style and does not get. Um, LibXL, has its own coding style, which is slightly different. Um, documents aren't very long. Um, they're pretty, sim pretty simple rules to follow, so just read through it and then try to follow it. Um, when you're making your patch, you want to make your patch an argument. So you want to try and convince, sorry, go ahead. Um, it's, I mean, so, so the, the, the coding style now is in the Zen tree. So any patch that changes the coding style has to be approved by the rest, which would be the, the committers, basically. That, does that make sense? Yeah, I was just wondering if, um, like, the first introduced tool data, that people first did make that 
Um, yeah, so, so initially there was a, we had a guy named Keir who was kind of the, the, the benevolent dictator kind of role and he just made all the decisions. Um, but he sort of faded from the scene and no one kind of you know, picked it up again. Um, so, so a lot of what was um, written in there was just writing down, codifying the preferences that he personally had. Um, but then basically, uh, as we go along, we sort of, you know, as we have things that people want to change, then you know, we sort of change them. Um, does that make sense? Um, same, same thing with the, so the LibXL coding style was, um, the guys who wrote LibXL didn't like the, the main coding style, so they <laughs> had a different one for their own little thing. Um, Yeah, it's, um, and, and like I said, there's, there's, there's kind of a, that, that's like the most important and the simplest easy to follow rules. There's like a thousand other rules like that we can't put in it. So, okay, any other questions on that? Right, so you want to try and make your, your patch or your patch series like an argument. Okay, so you're trying to convince the reviewer that um, this patch series is necessary, that uh, this is the, that, okay, there's a problem that needs to be fixed, but that this is the right way to fix the problem. And you also want to convince them that um, th this patch series actually has no bugs. So, um, sometimes this takes a little practice, but there's kind of a, there's a template that you can kind of keep in mind. You don't always have to follow this template, but it's a good reason, it's a good, good kind of a rule just to kind of prompt you for, for the things that you want. Um, so. A good way for, for a trained log is to describe the current situation, um, to say why, what's, the, what's wrong with the current situation, what's wrong with the status quo, what this patch does to fix it, and then any other changes that this patch is making, right? So here's just kind of a random example. Um, so describes what the situation is, IP tables, has a system lock, blah, 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 blah. Um, the problem that causes these error messages, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so we uh, add this w dash W option if it's available, right? And then what this allows the reviewer to do is it kind of clues them into, it reminds them, they're supposed to know everything about the code anyway, but often, you know, it, it takes them a while to get, get into it. So th they can verify, ah, uh, yes, this is the way that, this is the current situation, yes, that's true. And they can usually see, yes, I, I can see why that's a problem. And then they can, they, they see your short description of what the patch is doing. And they can verify that your patch is, is in fact doing that. Um, so basically this, just, this kind of mode of doing things helps the maintainer to have an easy job of uh, being convinced that your patch is, uh, it needs to be checked in. Um, and some more stuff I'm here we're gonna get in, into a little bit. Um, another factor that comes in is bisectability. Okay, so bisection is, it's often the case that like, um, you know, someone will test something here and then like, you know, maybe a month or two later they'll do a pull and, and they'll try something again and it will have broken. Um, and so there's, there's a thing you can do which is a binary search uh, to try and find it when it broke. So you say, you know, it worked here, it's broken here. All right, let's, set, let's test it here. Oh, it worked then. Okay, let's test it here. It's broken then. You sort of go back in until you find the exact chain set where it started to break. In order for this process to work, there's a very useful process. In order for this process to work, every chain set in between here and here has to actually work as a whole, right? So if, if I say, I start here, and then, okay, so this works, this is broken, this doesn't compile. Okay, well, let's try this one. All right, well, that worked, this doesn't compile. Okay, right, so this is really, really annoying. Um, and to be able to have a, a, a computer be able to do the, the, the bisection without any manual, manual intervention is a massive, is, is, is really helpful when finding bugs. So um, we want every chain set to be able to build and we want all the, all the, chain, all of the functionality which ever worked as much as possible to continue, to continue to work. Now obviously we can't be perfect about this, but this should be our goal. Um, and when you're writing a patch series, this is what you have to keep in mind, okay? Um, every, patch, every patch in this series should be able to build and nothing should um, break previously working functionality except by accident. Um, so you want to break, break your patch trees down into logical chunks, um, but yeah, don't break existing functionality. Don't introduce bugs in one fix in one patch and then fix them in another. Okay, um, this is something that happens sometimes. Um, you can introduce code that isn't used, um, but you can't introduce code that doesn't build. Right. So uh, sometimes it'll happen as you, you'll uh, build some bit of fun functionality in the hypervisor, but 
uh, you do the hypervisor stuff first, and then like the tool stack, and then you know, and then like mid middleware libraries, and then in the tool stack. Um, and that's okay because it builds at every point, right? So even if the uh, hypervisor stuff doesn't isn't usable yet, that's fine. But you can't break build or or something like that. Okay. Any questions on bisectability? Okay, just a couple mechanics. Git send email. Uh, if you haven't used it, uh, basically just I mean, Google. I'm not going to tell you how to use it, but it makes everybody's life a lot easier. Um, and I'll just go with this. Okay, so here's, here's our patch again. So git send email um, can often s can send a mail like this. And um, th there, git, git can also automatically take mail and take it from a mail format and put it into git. And when it does that, anything below the, see these three lines here, just below the sign, the sign off that is dash, dash, dash. Anything below the three lines, Git will automatically take out, right? And so basically, uh, when you send a patch, anything above those three lines will be checked into the Git tree and stay there kind of in perpetuity. Anything below those three lines will be thrown away. And so the idea is anything you want to remain in the tree, you put above those lines. Anything you want to you, anything that you want to have to be just to the current people reading the patch, just to the reviewers, just on the mailing list, you put below the three lines, right? Um, so here's an example. So for instance, this is my patch that describes you know, what, what it's going to do. I have a little section here that says the other option would have been to do blah, 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 right? So that's just telling the current people reviewing the code what the other options might have been and why I chose this option instead of the other option, right? That saves people time, but there's no reason that comment needs to be in the in the change log, right? So, sorry, let me go, go back a bit. Uh, right. Um, the other thing that so get send email will do automatically is if you have anything. That, so any, anything that it sees an, as a as an email address, right? So the reported by, signed off by, but also the CC, it will automatically CC those people. So when you are, um, the easiest thing to do if you're preparing a patch is to put the maintainers in these CC lines, and then all the, um, the maintainers will automatically be emailed when you just get sent email. Um, right, what not to put into a change log. Um, so, or what to put in, what, what not to put in. So if there's a current commit that, if it's a commit that's already in the tree that you want to refer to, so for instance, um, if there's a current commit that broke something and you want to fix it, right? Um, if you want to refer to that, then refer to the short hash that's in the public tree, and perhaps if you want to, a short title. So this is kind of this would be kind of a traditional way of doing things. So the hash allows anyone to find exactly the commit that, that you want. Um, the description helps people figure out, make sure they have the right one, and uh, g have a guess what, what 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 the what the change that was before you um, before they actually look it up. Um, if you want to reference previous discussions, then um, don't put a link to the actual discussion in the bit that you're going to check into the, to, to Git, right? So summarize it in the change log so that if someone is going through it offline, they don't have to sort of go back and find out what it is. Um, if you want to refer to a longer version of it, um, then put the, a link to the, long, the longer discussion um, below the the dash 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 line. Um, and of course, you can refer to uh, manuals. So for instance, the Intel and AMD manual have reference, you know, sort of volume, chapter, subsection references are stable, uh, which means uh, you can put something like volume three, chapter four, section four, point four, whatever. And then all the future versions of it, even when they add stuff, you, that will still point to the same section. Uh, any questions about that? Okay, um, reposting. Uh, so, if you were, you want to include the version number to make it easier for people to figure out which version of the series they should be reviewing and should check in. Um, you know, version equals you know dash dash version is what you want uh, for get send email for that. Um, you want to list the changes that you made uh, between the last version and, and the current version. Um, so, if if you remember in the uh, the other slide that I had, you can find it here. So it says. You know, so version two, da 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 da, um, and that helps the reviewer again to know what the new version does. Um, 
And if you're not sure about something, and you basically your all-purpose pass for posting anything you want without having too much, you know, critical review is RFC. If you put RFC in the subject line, what it means is um, request for comments. And basically, what this makes clear to the reviewer is that you are not expecting it to be checked in as is, right? So. Uh, RFC means you don't have to make sure the code is 100% clean. You don't have to make sure you're following all the style guidelines. You're just trying to get an idea. Is this corner the right direction to go in? You know, should I pursue this direction or should you do something different? Um, and so you're kind of all-purpose pass for not having uh, super strict is, is the RFC. Design documents. Um, so in, apparently in, in the Linux kernel, I guess, they, they don't really like, basically they want to see code. Um, in the Zen community, we kind of feel like it's a waste of everybody's time. So once you've actually written up a series and tested a particular way of doing something, a particular solution to the problem, you have a lot of investment in that. And to go and tell you, you know what, the whole way that you're doing this is completely wrong, start from scratch and do it a different way. I mean, I would hate, I hate it when that happens to me. Um, and we hate to be able to tell people they have to do that as well. So, for anything that is, um, you think might be controversial or any larger changes, um, then what we do is we submit a des design document. And the idea behind a design document is before you start coding, to get kind of feedback um, about what the maintainers think is a promising direction to go in. Now a design document, uh, the document is not the code. And it's often the case that what sounds good on paper when you actually code it up doesn't actually look very good. So it may still be the case that you do a design document and then you, you code it up and then someone says, actually, I don't like that. We have to do it a different way anyway. Um, but most of the time, when we do design documents, we identify most of the problems beforehand um, and it makes it a lot easier for everybody. So uh, yeah, if you have a, long, a larger thing that you want to do, you're not sure how to approach it, try a design document and see how it works. Uh, the last thing is just dealing with, dealing with maintainers. Um, the first thing to say is just, you know, over email, there's no context. Like, you can't see the person's face. You can't hear the tone of voice. Um, and maintainers are often quite busy. And so it's, it's very, very easy for us to simply go um, respond to bam, 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 just point at all the different things that are wrong. Um, so short and direct, not saying a lot of sort of, this is really good, and not saying a lot of positive things. Um, we'll probably sh it's better if maintainers could say, thank you for your patch, first at least. Um, but often, we just forget. Um, so don't worry about that. So, so usual, but okay. So short and direct. Um, uh, that said, one of the things we do not really, we, we do not accept in the Zen community is any, anything that's demeaning uh, to the code or, or to the people. Um, so uh, yeah, so Linux style rants are not, not okay on our list. And um, if you, uh, of course, this was, and there's another thing was kind of a judgment call is if the maintainer is being unreasonable, right? So if you have a problem, either you think that someone has been demeaning particularly, or if you think, you know, that there's a maintainer who's just not being very reasonable, they're not actually working with you, not helping you, um, then contact Lars, the community manager, and he can sort of take a look at the situation. Um, the last thing to say is that, you know, the maintainers are often quite busy, and even if we intend to do something, we sort of, um, it gets lost on our list. So if you post a patch and you haven't heard anything back in two weeks, then just reply to the patch again um, and say, ping, you know, what's going on with this? And that will sort of wake up the maintainer and say, yes, uh, okay, I actually need to look at this. Okay, I think that's the main things. Um, are there any questions you guys had about contributing? Yeah? So do we have a... All right, so do we have a check patch script? Um, no. <laughs> it would be very nice to have, uh, and kind of every once in a while someone says, hey, we should have a check patch script, but um, no one's found the time to do it. So if you want to submit one, you know, I'm sure we would all appreciate it. Right. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is, how is, um, what's the difference between a design document and an RFC? Well, an RFC is a patch that actually changes the code. Um, and the design, well, in, in, so in, in our kind of the way, the way that we use it, and a design document is a, is a, is a document. Um, it's prose that says, I plan on doing this, or I think we should do, this is why I want, this is why I want to do this thing. These are the different areas. This is what I propose, da, 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 da. So um, a design document might have a little bit of code in it, but mostly it would be prose, um, text. Um, whereas uh, an RFC, the way that we use it typically um, would be, well, you, you can say RFC for a document as well, but basically if you, you put RFC in a patch series, then it says, um, or, or at a patch header, it means, I don't know if this is the right thing or not, uh, please take a look. Does, does that answer your question? All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess if you have any other questions about, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So when I was uh, trying to send, uh, uh, for example, V2, V3, and uh, maybe uh, I don't have some patches in V2 or V3, but uh, later on when I was uh, trying to push uh, the v, uh, V5, uh, I added some extra patches. And uh, when it comes to the uh, sixth version of the whole patch theory, so what's the version number for the new patch? Because if I use uh, the, for example, git format patch uh, uh, slash uh, v, and uh, it will generate, uh, uh, for example, uh, version six for all these patch series, uh, but uh, it, it in fact is uh, first uh, or second version of my yeah. new patch. <laughs> yeah. So um, the version number is the version for the series, not for the patch, right? So, so basically, attempt one is, so, so attempt one of your series might have two patches. Attempt two might have three patches, right? Attempt four might have two patches again, right? So it, it's the series, and, and all, of the, all, of the, um, all of the patches in the series should be labeled according to the version number of the series. D does that make sense? Um, yeah, so, so, so it should always be the series. So, so the, the idea is to help the, um, to help people reading it to know which, set of things go together and which ones they should look at, right? So, um, th that's kind of a judgment call. I mean, it's just what, um, so you, so the, the question is, what, what if the, the design is completely, completely changed? Um, in that case, uh, it's just trying to understand what would make it more, most clear to the, to the, to the people, to the reviewers. Um, and if it's a completely new set of patches, you might just start off with version one again. Um, or you might continue, like, con you know, continue inter incrementing the version number. Um, and at, at that point, it, it's, it's not 100% clear, which, which is better, but yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. They went to Okay. Um, anything else? Okay, well, if you have any more questions, I mean, come up to me or one of the maintainers who can ask uh, afterwards. And I think, I guess that'll, that's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>